Dave Shute. I'm the executive director here at Hopewell. Before I get into my prepared remarks, um, welcoming you and introducing Joanna, I have to apologize. My wife is out of town on business. The One of the hundreds of different roles my wife plays in my life is you weren't thinking of wearing that shirt with that coat, were you? And so she was not here to do that tonight. So if, if I don't quite work or friends on Zoom, if it's not quite working for you, I apologize on behalf of my entire family. Um, so it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of our board and staff to Hopewell's annual David Cutler Conservatory Exploring Mental Health series. For those of you who don't know, Hopewell is a residential community for folks with severe mental illness um, on a working farm about an hour from here near Middlefield, Ohio, in the middle of Amish country. It's right now incredibly beautiful with the changing leaves and the smell of wood smoke as the Amish heat their homes. We help people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, OCD, major depressive disorder, and other severe mental illnesses thrive, find their best selves, and become more independent. We do that from a residential stay that's typically five to seven months. It may be shorter, it may be longer, through the healing power of nature, through our meaningful work, through the therapeutic community we provide, and through our deep and strong clinical team. Over the years, Hopewell has been fortunate to be able to have at Exploring Mental Health a number of interesting and informative speakers. Some have been both. And um, we're really particularly looking forward on the interesting and informative side to tonight's presentation by Joanna Lilly. This annual event is made possible by Sandy and Sally Cutler, who support it in honor of their son, David. They couldn't be here tonight, but since we're recording this and they may see it later, I wonder if we could just do a little round of applause thanking the Cutlers. Our speaker tonight is Joanna Lilly, uh, National Certified Counselor. Joanna is a therapeutic consultant who provides guidance and support to young adults in need of mental health or substance abuse treatment and to their families. Joanna earned a master's in counseling from West Virginia University and worked in the intersection of mental health and young adults, both before getting that degree and since getting that degree, including it with colleges, with um, family and children's centers, with private mental health and community agencies, and with a therapeutic gap programs for students with learning differences. And then she founded in 2016, her therapeutic consulting firm, um, Lilly Consulting. She's the former chair of the Therapeutic Consulting Association of America. And it was actually in that role that I first met her because she was at a keynote speaker at a conference I was at. She's the former host and perhaps going to be the host again of a podcast, the former host or co-host of a um, alternative to college fair and she's a speaker and a nationally sought after consultant in her specialty of creating unique treatment plans and resource recommendations and placement recommendations for young adults struggling with psychological concerns and with the intersection of those psychological concerns with higher education in particular. Joanna's topic tonight is navigating the mental health crisis in young adults. She quite, this is her profession navigating the mental health crisis in young adults. And she literally could go on for hours about that. And she's actually a little worried that she might, but we're not good, she's, she won't. Um, we, her formal presentation will probably be, you know, half an hour or so. And then after that, we will take questions. So we're gonna ask you to hold questions. If you're on Zoom to type questions into the chat box. If you're here in our live audience, we have at each table, some index cards and some pens um, for you to write any questions that might emerge either over the course of Joanna's presentation or at the end of it that might come to you. This is an enormous topic. There's a number of things you might have questions about. Joanna has probably seen them. The Hopewell staff has probably seen them. 
So we welcome your questions. Um, after Joanna's prepared remarks, Daniel Horn, our clinical director, will then moderate those questions to Joanna. So our staff will collect the index cards from the tables. Daniel will go through the index cards and he'll read them off to Joanna. And then Tim Bidding, our um, national outreach manager, will handle the questions that are coming in via Zoom. So hold your questions, right? If you're in the audience here, write them down. If you're on the Zoom audience, write them in the chat box. Finally, here in Northeast Ohio, we claim our native son, Travis Kelsey, as one of us. Lately, we've kind of taken to claiming Taylor Swift too as one of us. And then after tonight and from today forward, we're gonna claim Joanna Lilly as one of us. So please join me in welcoming Joanna Lilly from Lilly Consulting. Okay, that was an exciting introduction and you do now have my entire backstory, but the, the hope in that is that you understand that I have been living and breathing what feels like a public health epidemic for more than 15 years. And so I think with COVID, I'm going to do my best. With COVID, it's amplified, right? We're seeing an extreme spike in what, like this just befuddling and confusing situation, which is the crisis we're dealing with with young adults and how to navigate supporting them. Like Dave said, I live and breathe this on a daily basis, helping individual families, getting connected to programs like Hopewell, which is, um, you know, a joy for the work that I do. But what I want to front load in all of this too is that I don't want to I don't want to just talk about the morbid nature of the crisis that we're in. So that was actually one of the things that we discussed as we were kind of planning for this is like how do we make sure that this just doesn't that everybody in this audience doesn't walk away saying gosh that was just really depressing and also there feels like there's zero hope, right? And that's what You'll see me, I'll be talking kind of candidly right now. Once I get to a specific slide, I actually am going to look at some notes. Like Dave said, I can talk at nauseum about this topic uh, endlessly. And so I wanna make sure that I am staying on track, but most importantly, I want, I want room for conversation. So I am gonna talk at you, but hopefully it will also elicit some questions that you have or some comments that you wanna share. Because again, my hope is that by the end of this, we're all walking away, not just knowing that we have a significant um, job that we are, we're working on now, but it's gonna to continue to exist for a while. And you'll, you'll know why as I continue to talk about it. So I'm gonna to try to use a clicker. We'll see if this works. Yes, all right. Fun fact, one of the things we didn't talk about in my academic like academic and employment history is that I actually got a degree in art education, which not a lot of people know. But be because of that, I am like always a sucker for art history or like flashed slides. And so when I was thinking about the actual topic or the title of this topic, I really wanted to pick it apart. And then I'm also obviously a visual person. So I, I'm gonna talk about this image here for a second as a way to also lay the foundation for what else we're talking about here in a little bit. Um, first of all, we're talking about navigation. So when we're talking about navigation, we're talking about chart reading, we're talking about wayfinding, we're talking about the, the ascertaining of like making sure that we're actually reading or, or following a path. But I think what we have missed or what, what exists within the mental health space is that there is no clear path. There is no linear path. In fact, it's actually quite tumultuous as this image is presenting. Um, this is what we're dealing with. And then the other part or, or you know, one other key word in the title is that we're in a crisis. We're, we're dealing with a calamity, a catastrophe, like any other synonym that you want to use for, you know, this really, again, depressing moment where we feel like we're, we're in it. So in this image, I'm thinking about like crashing against rocks or like really tumultuous seas or this sky that looks um, quite terrifying, almost like there's no, no uh, 
sun or break in the horizon. And again, I'm going to be that cheesy person that weaves the metaphor throughout the presentation as we're talking about things, because I think that also just helps us connect the dots. But more importantly, it ties us back to this idea that we are truly navigating a crisis right now with young adults. And it's really important to understand that this is what they, this is what we're seeing, but this is what they're feeling. <sighs> okay. So if anybody can name the artist and the time period, I would just like give you a high five, but I'm not going to do that to you. I think you can, you get a sense. Um, oh, user errors. Okay. Um, so the one thing that you also see so quickly, I should also say this, I have five slides total. I'm going to be doing a lot of talking and that's because I don't want, I don't want to be that person that's like, all right, we literally are at slide 37 and I have 20 more to go. That's not, that is, that's not that exciting. Again, I could talk uh, indefinitely about this. And so I'm going to do my best to like, keep it really tight. Um, I also am not including citations on this because it gives me an opportunity to connect with anybody that is curious more about data or research. So I put some of my business cards on the table out front. If you are that type of person that's like, I need to know where you got those numbers. I need to know kind of where you got that data. I'm happy to share it, but I'm asking you grab my card or my contact will be uh, on the last slide. So quickly, just talking about who we're talking about. One in five youth and young adults experience a mental health condition. For most statistics, we're talking about anxiety and depression as a baseline, meeting criteria. So that's a, an extremely high percentage. Like David said, too, I also am connected to higher education, so I'm going to kind of infuse that in. But don't assume that every time I'm talking about young adulthood that I'm specifically speaking to college students only. I'm talking about just this age chronologically or developmentally. 75% of all lifetime mental health conditions begin by age 24. Again, this is why this is such a crisis in young adulthood right now. Uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death between 15 and 25 year olds, which is just extremely heartbreaking. And then I obviously have to put in the binary statistics about men being more likely to be suicidal. But the reality is we're not, I didn't list, but I think it goes without saying that our LGBTQ community is astronomically higher in terms of their risk. Here's my, here's my like higher ed geeking out. In fall of 2021, college student enrollment for students between the age of 18 and 24, which is what most colleges see for their age group, only 38% of young adults between 18 and 24 were actually college students. So that means that there's a lot of young adults that aren't on a college campus. There's nothing wrong with that. It just, it, it begs the question, where are they? And then because of COVID, right, we're, we're following this track in fall of 2022, we see an 8% decrease. Now, if you're working in higher education, you are freaking out. Where are these kids? How do we get them on campus? We need to have our student body. They, cre they create the campus culture. But the reality is we've got almost an additional million, one million young adults that within the last year have not enrolled on a college campus. And again, I'm gonna try not to be morbid, shocking you with these numbers, but I think this is why the notepad and the pen is on your table, because I want you to think about questions to ask. Where are they? How do we support them? How do we find them? It's not, not just about the young adults, it's about the families. Where are they? How do we support them? And then if we support them, we know that we're supporting their young adult. So I'll start by also saying, what else? This is not an invitation for anybody to chime in right now because <laughs> that seed has been planted. All questions are at the end, but it is again, an invitation to write a question or put a comment specifically on one of those note cards to discuss later. These top issues are what literally when I sat down and I was like, what? am I seeing? What am I seeing? What are consultants seeing? What is existing right now? Again, my lens is the last 15 years, young adulthood. These are the top five things that I'm seeing anecdotally that are impacting young adulthood. And that's what's kind of adding to this, again, this storm, right? We're, we're in the storm. 
So first things first, smartphones, when we're talking about 18 year olds, those students were born in 2005. So as a two year old, right? <laughs> I know I think about that. I'm like, that was like yesterday, 2005. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they live a life. They have, they've always lived a life, not with cell phones, specifically smartphones, access to the world at their fingertips. So we are seeing problematic tech use, right? Internet use or tech addiction. We're seeing with social media specifically that comparison of self to others based on the, um, you know, just your perception of self. It's, it's significantly impacting the self-esteem of our young adults. We as older adults are saying, we know we're not fools. Like that's somebody's like good moments. We know that life is not always sunshine and rainbows, but unfortunately our youth don't understand that because all they see are these happy, successful moments. And so then they compare themselves, which is, um, again, the perfect storm. Uh, what, there was one other thing I wanted to say with tech, but it's beside the point. I might come back to it later. Um, marijuana, <laughs> we like to talk about drugs all the time. Um, this is one of those things that more specifically when it comes to mental health, the biggest thing that I see, and I will also say, it's not that I am anti-cannabis and it's not that I'm pro-cannabis. It's more of, I am interested in education around cannabis. Parents don't understand, and I'm grossly generalizing the difference in what cannabis is now versus what it was for them. Same with grandparents. If you are like, I can't tell you the number of times that I get that expression. Well, at least they only smoke weed. And I just want to pull my hair out because the reality is if they understood the amount of THC that was actually in that, that cannabis that they were potentially paying for their child, um, to use to self-medicate, then they may understand the risks that exist. So programs like Hopewell or maybe others in the room understand too that because of the increased THC, we're now also seeing uh, an extremely high spike in drug-induced psychosis, specifically with cannabis. And that is where then once you're in the hospital system, it is just, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. So it's one of those, that to me is a domino effect of a pretty, pretty scary trajectory or journey that a young adult might be going through. And subsequently the family is also on that journey with them. So being mindful that that is, that's, that's not to be under reported or underlooked. Um, standardized testing in schools. Also going back, we had our No Child Left Behind Act that was introduced in 2002. I'll date myself. I was one of like the first classes in high school that was on my way out. And they were like, hey, take this test. You're going to essentially model whether or not this is something that we're going to start to give to students in your state moving forward. I did not take it seriously. My sister, who's eight years younger than me, lived a completely different life academically. And I got to, to witness that on the periphery where she would really get anxious or nervous or struggle with this idea of, I have to excel, I have to pass. This is going to lead to right X, Y, Z. And this is, again, now we're, now, we're, now we're at all of these intersections of like, well, social media and the pressure and all the things. But in addition to that, right? I say outcome fever, it's also related to this, idea or introduction, and this is where the higher ed piece comes in, now we're exposed to all these different schools. We're exposed to how everybody supposedly is going to college, which we know if we go back to the data, that's not true. Not everybody's in school, but it, the perception of everybody going to school exists on social media and not just any school, the elite schools or schools that you just wanna seek because they are seen as out of reach. And so we've got these young people that are driving themselves towards perfection, completely burnt out on education, not curious about education, but focused, hyper-focused on these accolades that at the end of the day won't really mean anything about who they are as a person representing themselves or their family once they graduate from high school. It is a system it's a system that needs to be adjusted significantly, right? That education system. But I, I'm sure that I am 
in, in good company where you all are like, yeah, that's really stressful. So if we're so focused on the outcome, right, or the destination, we miss the journey. We miss the ability to be curious. And that's where we have a bunch of young people that just have lost this, this interest in, I don't know, like life. Because of that too, and I'll just say these last two things quickly, and then we're moving on to something more specifically, because this is me saying, I acknowledge I can talk for a long time. Um, there is a lot of pressure still from parents. This is tied to, and again, I'm grossly, grossly generalizing. Not everybody does this, um, but it is generational. Grandparents of young adults right now were the ones who said to their kids, we need you to strive to be better than me, right? My legacy for you is that you have a better life than I had. That was, that was just kind of the American way. And now parents of our young adults are, are kind of inherently doing the same thing, right? I still want you to do better than me. I still want you to earn that degree. I still want you to make money and achieve these things. But the disconnect is that a lot of parents have done really well. They've earned those degrees. They've achieved those accolades. They've, they've had success. And because of, again, the, the weaving in or all of these factors playing out together, the young adult looks at their parent and says, why would I do that? Like, why would I work myself to the bone to get to where you are? It doesn't look fun. You are stressed out, right? Like, there's just no interest. There's an opportunity. Here I am saying we've got young adults that really like aren't thinking, but the one thing that they are making a decision about is I don't want to put in the effort. That looks really hard. And so I think that, and again, grossly generalizing. So if you're in the room and you're like, I'm a parent and I don't do that to my kid, then you're awesome. Okay. I want to like highlight that, but this is just this is often what I'm seeing that that affect for young adults and the lack of drive when they have been put, uh, you know, to pressure with parents of like, but you got to go to school. College education is what's most important. That's the indicator of success moving forward. When in 2023, we know that that's actually not true. You can actually do an accelerator program and make six figures in less than three months. I wish that existed when I was an undergrad. No, I'm just kidding. But um, anyways, things to think about. So last thing that I'll say is the COVID fallout. And then I'm going to jump into actually following my notes. Across the board, we all, including those of us in this room, experienced global grief. We experienced significant loss, depending on where we were in our life, family members, what that looked like. It was traumatic. And for young adults, this emerging adult population, we've got this colossal loss of drive. You missed milestones. You missed the ability to um, celebrate, right? There were things that just felt so important that now all of a sudden just disintegrated. And there was this significant movement or lack of movement, hence the uh, decrease in enrollment in taking that step forward. Okay, what's the point? Now everybody's got acute stress. What if all of a sudden there's another virus that pops up and the world shuts down? But then also parents were inviting their young adults back home. It's safe for you here. And then we we forgot that we have to still nudge them at some point to get back out there. But we've been so comfortable. We've been so fearful that this has, it's just driven a wedge in the productive nature, the drive, the interest for young adults. And then you factor in everything else, right? The tech, the marijuana use, because again, now that I'm home, I might as well be smoking weed because at least that's going to help pass the time. I've got no drive or no education. And it just creates this place where it's like, I am so disconnected. I'm so isolated. And I just feel so unmotivated. Again, trying not to be morbid super morbid right in this moment. Now moving forward, I'm going to try to put a spin on everything that we discussed to talk about, again, what we're seeing, but more importantly, what we can do about it. Um, if you are in K a K-12 system, or if you work in higher education, uh, or if you work in any area of wellness with young adulthood, 
any, any young adults, you might be using the eight dimensions of wellness or maybe not, or maybe some like kind of abbreviation for it. I brought this up because I want to quickly keyword, cause I'm actually going to keep myself on track, um, go through each of these to just highlight what is it, what does it even mean? First of all, when I say this one particular area of wellness, what are we seeing specifically? And then going back to the, uh, title for this presentation, like, how are we navigating it? How, how do we navigate, how are we navigating it now? How do we move forward navigating to make sure that we're actually at a place helping the young adults to achieve that area of wellness? Um, y'all ready? Okay. I'm staying on track. Okay. Um, the first, we'll just start at the very top. Emotional wellness is one's ability to handle, I'm just you know, going to be super simplistic about it. It's our ability to handle life's stresses. Um, and so what are we seeing with young adults? We're seeing distress intolerance or tolerance, like, right. It doesn't really exist. We're struggling to see any type of resiliency, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later, potentially. Um, we're also going to see a lot of failure deprivation. And what I mean by that is some young people that maybe have been really sheltered, up until they kind of launched from home. And so all of a sudden they've never experienced failure. What happens then? They go off to college, they fail their first exam or they get rejected on their first date and it's the end of the world. There is no coming back from that. It is, it's devastating. And for those of us who have resiliency or have experienced failure and kind of work through it, then we're saying, what's the problem? Well, again, we're dealing with a generation of people that are really struggling with those skills. So we have to help. So what can we do? How do we help navigate that? We have to make sure that they have a support system. I'm not, I'm not always going to say everybody needs a therapist, but obviously we're talking about mental health here. And if we're talking about mental health, we need to talk about being connected to some sort of therapeutic professional. We also have life coaches. We have psychiatrists. Like we have people that are ex existing out there to support and help or therapeutic communities, right? Like things exist. And so that's important in terms of making sure that we are like, what are we doing to navigate this for the physical area of wellness? What we're talking about there is nutrition, exercise, weight management, actually tobacco use, surprisingly, uh, disease prevention. I'm going to read a quote because I think this is important. If you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. And when I, when I, I'll say that again, cause I felt like that was important. Like, okay, there's a lot of like, ooh's in the room. If you don't make time for your wellness, you will be forced to make time for your illness. That is so important because when we look at the young adults that exist right now, if we are isolated, inactive, unmotivated in terms of some sort of career or education or whatever, we're dealing with a really, uh, a really challenged or at risk in terms of physical wellness uh, group. Our diet consists of lots of sugars, right? Lots of sweets, you name it. It's, it's an issue. And so the importance of not just saying, here's how you cook, but also like getting to the root of what is nutrition? What am I putting into my body? And then making that, that brain and gut connection, which also just in general is really important in terms of people's wellness. Um, the other thing that I throw out there too, is sleep hygiene. When we have gaming or that problematic tech use, now all of a sudden we have a population of young people that will actually go to bed at five or 6 a.m., if that even. And then they're waking up maybe at four, two, three, four in the afternoon. Well, it's just a different world. It's important. And I'm not saying that that's not the right cycle. It's just, it has to be important to make sure that they're actually getting all their physical needs met. And that could include daily walks. Okay, occupational, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm ad-libbing a little too much. Okay. I appreciate that. I like needed that validation right in that moment. Um, my hope too, is that actually, in just briefly talking about these pieces that again, it'll elicit more questions and conversation at the end. So occupational wellness, when we have a generation of young people who are, well, back up, what is it? We got to start with that. We're talking about personal satisfaction of their job or career. 
just across the board. So then what are we actually seeing with young adults? Well, I'm seeing a bunch of young adults that have never worked a job before in their life. I don't know if you're seeing that too, or are struggling. Yes, I'll work a job, but I'm going to work it for a week. And there's no passion behind it. It's just, this is some arbitrary task that I have to do. But in order to contribute to society, you have to do something. In order to take care of yourself, you have to do something. So occupational wellness is so important for our young adults. And then I'm going to keep tying this in. If we've got access to our phones and we're looking at all of the different careers that exist out there, it is so easy to be not just overwhelmed, but over overwhelmed to the point of paralysis of never being able to initiate any type of job application or interest in a career. Well, why would I do that if there's literally millions of other jobs that I can work right now? It's like, it's so big. It's so daunting that they can't even kind of take that step back and say, well, I have to start somewhere. So that's what's important for us in terms of how do we navigate that? We have to make sure that our young people have opportunities. If they're not working a job because that's too much, job shadow, right? Even just a day. If somebody needs help, what does that look like? What does that mean? Then we're going back to our support team, right? In terms of the emotional wellness, have somebody help facilitate that process. We have to be volunteering. That's so important to be able to give back. Uh, there are career assessments that exist out there that actually have really interactive reports where not only we're at list, like here are the top 100 jobs that are actually applicable or interesting to you based on this questionnaire that you filled out. But oh, by the way, it tells you every type of degree or education you need in order to get there. And then you can click on it and there's videos about it. So there's ways to engage, right? When you think about all of the jobs that are possible, well, 100 is a lot less daunting to pick from other than like actually looking at just your phone and whatnot. Okay, moving on. Social. I think that I could probably walk away with not saying anything about this. This one's just so easy. We're talking about our relationships. We're talking about our connections. It's so important. What are we seeing? We're seeing young people that are extremely disconnected because they're on tech or because they're just at home or not at home, or in their residence hall, just like on their laptop, disengaged. We are so disconnected socially from other people that it's no wonder everybody feels lonely because they are lonely. But it's so important for, and again, this isn't just college students, this is young adults. Well, if you don't have friends, or if you don't have partners or relationships, then it's so easy to feel so lost in so many ways. And then that adds to the mental health crisis that exists. I have anxiety about meeting other people, right? So then it goes back to, well, maybe what are you going to do to self-medicate in order to feel comfortable putting yourself out there? Or what's the point altogether, right? I've tried, I got rejected, so I'm just not worthy. It's this really, really uncomfortable narrative. So what are we doing? Okay. Again, like set hat, not sad side of this thing is that we need to create opportunities and space for young adults to reconnect. We have to go back to our roots. We have to have an opportunity where, where they can actually be together, whether that's, you know, in a community or whether it's just on a campus or wherever, but we have to make sure that they're not in a space physically where they're all in their own little corner on their phone, pretending like they're connected, but they're really not. And the one little asterisk that I will say that's important in all of this is I do work with a lot of young adults that want to remind me, and I do want to say it because I want to validate it. If you have a small friend group, uh, if you're really into gaming, if you have a friend group and you say, those are my real friends, they are your real friends. I want to name that because I think sometimes we invalidate young adults that have friends online and we say, those aren't your real friends. I want you to have real friends in person. I want to name that those are still their real friends. And we need to make sure that we provide opportunities for them to be connected to those friends in person. Spiritual wellness. All right, I'm, I'm still going. Um, this is the search for purpose or meaning in life. This is 
we have, and it's not meant to be religious, but it can be if that's how it's interpreted. It just is this idea that there is a higher power, which for those of us in the room, it just means that I am not self-centered, that the world doesn't revolve around me, that there are things that matter, I matter. So when I'm seeing a bunch of young adults that are not connected religiously, have no experiences, again, volunteering or whatever, where they've had an opportunity to think outside of themselves, then we have this like collective of lost souls that really don't understand what their purpose is. They don't understand why they're here. And so it's really important for us to provide opportunity in that, in the lane of spiritual wellness to connect them to whatever that looks like, a rite of passage, an intentional activity or an event where they really are being pulled outside of themselves figuratively to make sure that they have an opportunity to understand that that is so important, that there is purpose, that there is meaning. Intellectual wellness, home stretch, three left, um, is the idea for thought provoking mental activities. And I think this actually ties to the, when we talk about that outcome fever, right, or the standardized testing that was introduced in our K-12 system, unfortunately, what happened is that we just, we stopped having to really critically think. I think that's the other, you know, it's the double-edged sword for the smartphone, and I'll be the first to admit it. Like, sometimes I literally have to stop my say, stop myself and say, Hey, I'm, I'm in a conversation with somebody and we're asking like, oh, I don't know. I wonder. I immediately go to my phone and I'm like, Google, right? And I'm like typing in something to figure it out. But it's like, if I just waited three seconds and, and almost participated in a fun activity to identify, I wonder if I actually know the answer, right? We have to critically think. We have to make sure that young adults understand that they have a brain, that they can use it, that it matters. And also when it goes back to that kind of failure deprivation, you can say something and it can be wrong and that's okay, right? We have to validate that. We have to allow space for them to do that because if they don't have opportunity to be challenged mentally, then we are again, kind of, it's all wrapped up together. Well, what's what's the point, right? I'm not an asset at my job. I don't have friends, right? It's this like total spiral in terms of um, that negative self-image. I hear this often too. I don't know, right? If I ask a young adult a question, I, I just don't know. Well, tell me, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I'd rather tell you I don't know than say anything and be wrong. So I think we have to challenge that too. If somebody says, I don't know for everything, we have to give them space where they can be, feel comfortable and say something other than, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Um, environmental wellness. I think this is also really important because this ties to the mental health epidemic the global pandemic, everything that we're kind of seeing, but it, it plays it plays a part. When we're talking about environmental wellness, we're talking about how the environment itself, and again, I'm being simpl simplistic, is impacting human beings. We're talking about sustainability. We're talking about recycling. We're talking about, you know, anything eco-friendly. I get a lot of young adults that have gotten to the point where they're indifferent about it. Why does it matter? Like, I'm not gonna have an actual influence right? The earth is literally about to combust, right? That's so, that's so dramatic, but that's what it feels like, right? What's the point? Global warming's real. That's what some young adults are saying. I don't know what you all feel, but just throwing that out there, it's hard to contribute when you feel like your contribution doesn't matter or it doesn't make a difference, but it does. Again, we're, we're giving back. This is of service. So I think the, the one thing that I would actually throw out there, which I love about this idea is kind of a two birds with one stone when we're talking about wellness is have some sort of volunteer experience that is tied to environmentalism in some way, shape or form, right? Because we're giving back and we're also connected to this idea. And I honestly think of all of these areas of wellness, environmental is probably the one that's most overlooked or just, it's not, it's never prioritized, but really we're talking about, this is the space that I'm gonna be growing up in 
this is the space where I'm potentially going to be um, having offspring in. I need to be thinking about the future. And if we're not thinking about the future, then it's easy to just not care. And lastly, financial. And I think we, we did hit on this a little bit earlier, but the piece with young adults, well, again, going back to what is it? Financial planning, money management, just in general, making sure that we're actually able to financially care for self. So when we've got a generation of people that have never worked a job, right? Or have no interest or a drive in working a job or are so fearful of working a job uh, or come from a family where they actually don't ever have to work a job, but it's not instilled. It doesn't matter. It's so important to make sure that we have the, we have the concept of where is our money coming from, right? Earning a dollar, that, that idea is, is lost on young adults right now. And then you also factor in we're in a mostly or largely cashless society. So gone are the ways of talking about balancing a checkbook. It's so different nowadays, but making sure that people are actually understanding when you swipe a card, that doesn't mean that you can swipe a card forever and never actually have to look at your balance or pay it off, right? There's, there is financial education that needs to be addressed and we're not doing that. And so that's kind of, I'm tying into the, like, how do we navigate it? We have to make sure that we're actually ensuring that young adults are working, are caring about their money, are enjoying saving money, right? Families need to make sure we are instilling that need for giving back or being of service or making a difference. And that's what matters about that idea of financial wellness. Okay. Now I'm done with the notes. Back to it. Um, I think the, the big summary in this, again, I, I put this slide up here because I, I could talk really broad strokes about all things mental health with young adults. And it's easier to just say, look, a, a, a truly well, like in terms of mental health, young adult has as balanced as possible areas of wellness. I'm not saying it's perfect, right? Because we're not striving for perfection for perfectionism, but what's important is that we're aware of how our, how that bucket, right. Or that area of wellness is being addressed or it's being neglected, right. It needs to be, uh, taken care of. So the summary in all of this is that young adulthood is, it was already daunting, right. There was, but it was like this exciting period of independence launching into adulthood, the idea of individuation, like all of that is really exciting, but it's also coupled with a lot of fear and trepidation. Um, and unfortunately, going back to our, our original theme of navigating kind of the, the heavy seas, we have to make sure that we understand that we're talking about young adults right now. But if you ask any educational psychologist or anybody that is in early child uh, early childhood development, they're saying, oh my goodness, COVID impacted our young people so significantly socially, right? Emotionally, physically. So again, we're talking about a lot of these areas of wellness. And so the important like call to action for everybody in this room really is that we're, we're in it and we're going to continue to be in it. And it's super important to make sure that we are mindful of what is impacting our young adults how do we actually support them? And, and to again, beat a dead horse with the metaphors, um, be on the boat with them, be in the water with them, understand that we are still in really scary seas, but there is a break in the storm on the horizon. We don't know how far, but it's important to make sure that young adults don't always believe that we're just going to be in the storm forever. And for those of us that are working with young adults, it's important for us to make sure that we also don't feel that way all the time. Uh, there is going to be, you know, again, calm seas on the horizon. I'm going to be super cheesy right now, like all the things. Um, yeah, it's 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 helpful to know that it exists. And the last thing that I'll throw out there is that there, again, is hope. We've got NAMI, we've got RAP, we've got ARDA, which is Hope Well. Um, the Therapeutic Consulting Association, which I was the former chair of. Um, if you're really into research, the Mary Christie Foundation, um, or 
uh, specifically for higher education is extremely important. And they actually send out weekly newsletters, which are just highlighting all areas of research, articles, information related to key areas, mostly mental health related, but key areas for this young adult college age population. And then my shameless plug for a podcast, which Dave had talked about before, but uh, I actually just wrapped this up in September and it is 200 individual interviews of people talking about demystifying what the definition of success looks like, but more importantly, sharing their own story, launching into adulthood, what they thought they were going to be doing, what they actually ended up doing. A lot of these folks are talking about their own mental health struggles, substance abuse struggles, change in ac academic trajectory or career path, leading to where they are now in their mid twenties up to their early seventies, right? I've got, I've got a wide, um, yeah, just a, a very fun group of people that I've interviewed over the last four years. But the reason why I did that as a passion pod project was to make sure that young adults understood that when you do experience a bump in the road, that it's going to be okay, right? If all of a sudden, if you think you know what you're going to do at 18 and it doesn't pan out, it's going to be okay, right? It's easy for us to say that to a young adult, but it's really hard for them to feel that and understand it. And again, that is our, that's our, our, you know, heaviest charge right now, our biggest task is to help them get to a place where they can, in fact, uh, feel excited. So I will stop talking because I feel like this is a great, great opportunity to break. Thank you for having me. And I also know we're going to have some questions. Daniel Horn will be moderating these questions. Um, I'll start with a couple um, so that Daniel has a chance to look through the uh, cards and, and address them. There, Daniel may also offer a Hopewell, perspective, a Hopewell perspective on the questions in addition to Joanna's perspective. But most importantly, you will see sunglasses and squeezy toys at your table. These are meant for you to take home. Right, so they're not meant as sort of like decorations that we then bring back home with us. They're meant for you. So, looking good, Ann. So I have um, two questions. I'll start with just one and then see if Daniel's ready to bring you one. Um, it's the sort of failure deprivation and resilience mm -hmm. issue. Like when, when parents, my age talk about how we parented versus how we grew up. We talk about how when, and these are, so our children are 10 to 20 years older than the ones you typically deal with other than 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so we talk about, I mean, when I grew up, I got home from school, I got out of my cl school clothes, I put on my play clothes and my mom shoved me out of the door. And she said, come back home when the street lights come on. And that's what we did. We hung around with the kids. We played. We ran in the canyon. We rode our bikes. Nobody had a bike helmet back then. We had life preservers, but we never wore them, and nobody expected us to wear them. We went to the parks alone without supervision. I walked to school alone without supervision through a part of downtown Oakland in California that later burned down after Martin Luther King was shot. So this is how I grew up. And our, my generation's kids grew up with milk cartons showing kidnapped kids. And with if you sent your kid out without a bike helmet on, you'd go to jail. Mm -hmm. And so this, you know, we, so many of your points about how, are more or less about how parents or other adults can help young people with this stuff. And yet, it, to a great extent, we created it for them. And I, I don't want you to sort of blame me for that or me personally in particular, <laughs> but it's like, you know, on resilience and failure deprivation, knowing that different people learn in different ways, mm -hmm. but what are some of the things that we can sort of proactively model and, and to let, to let them know that it's, it's okay to take a risk and implicit in that it's okay to take a risk is that it's okay to fail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the number one thing that parents could do is actually role model 
right? That's, that is something that's super important. It's not even the fact of the matter of allowing your children to do certain things. It's to actually just have conversations. Oh, by the way, did you know that when I applied to colleges, I actually only applied to 11 and I got into one. What? Um, I, here, here's like a little, uh, personal story that I only recently learned my dad for the longest time when I was growing up. So mind you, I'm older than the young adults that I work with now, but he, for the longest time would always tell me and my sister, I got straight A's, right? I went to an elite university and that, that bar is extremely high for both of you. And you need to strive to achieve my greatness. I remember always being like, okay, whatever. But fun fact, my grandmother moved from her house within the last year. And, and lo and behold, we found a box full of my dad's report cards. So, all, and s- surprise, they weren't straight A's. So you can imagine that my sister and I laid into my dad, but it was a great conversation, jokes aside, to really, to, to hit on, like, we have to be real right? Nobody lives this extremely perfect life. And if anybody in this room has never experienced adversity, I would like to like touch your hand because there's probably some sort of like magical piece to you in this universe. But the reality is that doesn't exist. Adversity is real. And it's so important for parents to understand what's safe adversity for young adults, like a safety net for young adults to experience. And so that actually, it starts long before a young adulthood. Cause right, what we're talking about is this population who's supposedly or hopefully launching out of the home. What we need to be focused on is elementary school students, middle school students, high school students, and really not putting that pressure on our young people to get straight A's, to only apply for the best schools or to only go to school. It's important to explore alternatives. Again, focus on what's your purpose, what's your passion, and really like allow that to flourish. Um, I know that that's also kind of counterintuitive to how parents now really believe that success exists. But all of that is to say, too, when we're talking about those areas of wellness again, you have to let somebody ride a bike without a helmet. Don't quote me on that, please. But you, you have to let them ride a bike. You have to let them go down the street. You have to be able to let them do the things. Now, we live in a much scarier world now than, you know, 20 years ago, but I still think that there's room for us to give our children, not our, not even our young adults, but our children, the space to actually scrape their knee. Yeah. I just realized that. It's just work. Yeah. It just works. Uh, nice to meet you or see you again. Um, I was chatting with Laura Skarnecchia earlier today and she insisted that I pass along her warm regards and she misses you. Tell her I said hi. I will. Uh, we have a young man in the audience today who reminded me that eight years ago today, he left Hopewell. Uh, he'll be graduating from Law Street uh, in May and he has a question for you. Uh, can you speak to the role of community and connection as well as economic justice in youth mental health? Does this exacerbate the drug problem? And do you see a role for 12-step programs, groups, spirituality, and group therapy or community activity? Jack. Wow. <laughs> he's, let, a, he's a future lawyer. Let me, yeah, <laughs> let me try to unpack that. First and foremost, there is space for community. So I'll also say too, as I answer this, if you're like, whoa, you're you're straying from the original question, just just let me know. I, there's there's room for community. I actually think that's what is that's that's the biggest piece that's missing, right? When we're talking about social wellness, our emotional wellness is tied to our our social connection. I think that's why programs like Hopewell do a fantastic job creating that sense of community. If you are isolated, you don't have that. Um, and I think that's also why we push or have been pushing for this idea of higher education, right? Your community is the class that you graduated with. Now go to college, find your community there. Well, if you're not in college, then what, right? And when we're talking about mental health in general for this population, it's easy for us to run down the, the, it's easy for us to go to community mental health and say, find a therapist, right? Or find a coach and that's all you need. That's that's a small microcosm 
of your support group, but the best, the best community that you can have is peers. Um, and especially if you are struggling or you identify yourself as struggling as a young adult to be in the room with other people that are having similar experiences, there's this opportunity of almost like a, a rising, I just have to do it, a rising tide will raise all ships. I just said, I was like, come on, another like boat analogy. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, it's important. Now there were a couple other pieces to that question and I might be missing the mark, but for those that are in recovery, right, whether it's mental health or substance use or both, I do think that there's, there's room for AA or 12 step or any other type of recovery, a recovery path. I think that's so important and why it's pushed is that sense of a higher power. Um, you know, obviously yeah, I'm going to stop myself. It's really important. All of it can be important. It's not for everybody. What else am I missing in that question? It was a lot. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. Like if I pull me aside afterwards and, and tell me what you wanted me to say. <laughs> All right. We've got a question from a high school teacher. What can be done to break the pressure of outcome fever while fostering interest in the educational journey rather than the destination? Oh, um, it is, I wish there was a, uh, like a, a silver bullet answer to this. There isn't because it all depends on the administration in your school, which depends on the ad administration in the school district, which depends on the administration within your state and what matters, what matters are test results that that's what continues to be. Uh, the drive or focus. I think there are a lot of school counselors that are trying to present to young adults, hey, it's not just like college fairs, but it is life after, right? Insert name of school fairs. And we're pulling in resources that exist, local communities, local all, you know, like vocational programs or, um, you know, accelerator tracks, whatever. It's so important to have individualized conversations with these students. It's also important to make sure that you're bringing in guests that didn't have what is seen as the tr you know traditional track. But really, again, when we look at the data, that isn't just because you have a college degree is not necessarily mean it's traditional. Um, I also worked in a K to twelve system doing college access programming, and it was it was wild to me because what I saw was this perfect dilemma of higher education again i'm 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 just speaking from my experience pointing their fingers at k to 12 saying you're not preparing our students for being students on campus and then the k to 12 system pointing their fingers at higher higher ed saying you're not you're not you're not doing enough right to prepare for the students that are showing up and their needs but the, the true direction that that all needs to take is we need to hit the pause on driving the outcomes, being that outcome fever, going to school, paying attention to where people are going, because that doesn't matter. I'm there. I'm like, really, I could be very R rated right now and how I feel about this, because I am extremely passionate having worked in K to 12 and having worked in higher ed, it's not going to change unless the administrator at your school says, we don't care. What we care is that you have a plan after high school and what that plan is. It doesn't matter what the plan is. As long as you have a plan, that's what matters. So good luck. <laughs> uh, there's a funny question that I can answer quickly. Serious question. Are you hiring? Uh, we are. We have a one single full-time clinical position available. Go to the Hopewell website and find out about it. Curious why you use wellness versus well-being. Wellness to me denotes a benchmark um, or an outcome or a clinical outcome. It's a great point. And I think honestly for this presentation, I just wanted to use it as a guide for talking about the areas in which our young people are struggling. I think we are talking about the human being, right? The that well-being is important. So at the end of the day, that's, that is really what I'm talking about. But I think for the sake of this conversation, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think it speaks to, that's why I was saying too, like, we're not looking at when I talk about those areas, right? Those specific kind of areas that we want to focus on. It's not that we're looking for this perfect equilibrium, right? We are talking about human beings. And I think that's, that's, that's more the individualization of what the person needs. But I think it's, I brought that up again, mostly as a tool. Cause Dave was like, Joanna, you got to have some structure. You're like, I was like, you're right. I do. What am I going to, what am I going to do? Okay. I think I'll just use this because it's something that's so common, but I appreciate that you actually just asked about that distinction and the difference. Cause what we're really talking about is well-being. Good. Uh, if you were a parent to young children, what is the number one thing you would try to do to assure good mental health in the children? Can I, well, I'll answer this, but I'm going to, I'm going to punt that to you to answer first, if you feel comfortable. Wow. Pressure. <laughs> well, the, yeah, actually the truth is the most important years of a child of a, well, actually of an adult is zero through three. And, and we think of that as not being terribly important because they don't remember it, but, but all the basic stuff gets developed then. So making sure that they, you know, all, all those circles that she had up on there, that all of those, I mean, you don't have to figure out an occupational plan for them yet, but they should be busy and doing things and their, their physical health should be taken care of and their emotional health should be taken care of. And all those circles should be attended to regularly. Um, so that they can grow up, you know, so it's, it's when those things aren't that, that personality breaks and, and they, they get set up for a, a mental health issues later in life. I think the only thing that I would add specifically, so thank you for answering that, is that if you have a young child who you are noticing um, some struggles because of the impact developmentally from COVID. So whether you gave birth during COVID or whether you had a first grader during COVID, being mindful of where they are struggling or how they are struggling now and thinking about how COVID did play an impact, right? Being removed from your classmates, education, interest. Now all of a sudden we're doing online learning for seven-year-olds. Like, I, I don't even know if I had had kids, like I have no idea how I would have been able to do that. So I just think about things like that, that are, you know, again, if you're, it's not just mental health, it's just overall, like, how are they doing? All parents, family, and children should get this education. How do you recommend we start to educate the public? They're talking about what you presented tonight. Well, this presentation will be housed. I'm, I'm looking at Dave because I was like, you are going to put this on your YouTube channel, right? And he just laughed. He was like, we don't have a YouTube channel. You should. We should. We should. There you go. Okay. We can put it on our website. We don't have a YouTube channel. We will figure it out. We have recorded this. We have Joanna's permission to stream it. So you'll be able to tell all your friends to go to our I think the other thing too, going back to some of, if this works, um, maybe, okay, just go back one, one slide. So there, nope, it's fine. The, yes, thank you. Um, I think NAMI specifically would be, if we're talking about lo localized resources, what's available and just education in general, I think they do a fantastic job of, of, Again, nationally, they have great resources, but um, there are local chapters, and that would be my direction first. And go connect with your local resource, your your local chapter. Let's talk about the socioeconomic factors to higher education. It's expensive, like many mental health treatment options. What are your thoughts on lobbying for more affordable mental health care, and in your opinion, the best approach? Okay, so. Read that for me again, because I think what I'm hearing is we're talking about the socioeconomic issues in higher education, but specifically about getting mental health care within yeah. higher education. Okay. All right. I got it. Um, okay. So it is challenging. I think that's one of the things that kind of falls on going through the college application process. 
I'm not a college consultant, so I'm going to like give that caveat. But as folks are looking into resources, it's so important if they actually are going to a school that maybe is, say, more rural, we need to make sure that what is available on campus is accessible to the students. What I'm seeing across the board, especially in more more rural or suburban environments, less urban, um, is going to be a push for like finding community mental health providers, well, they're already limited. And that means that the student has to pay for those services off campus. And so the university needs to actually provide those resources. Since COVID, I've seen, I've actually seen a lot of colleges and universities reduce their college counseling department. I've also seen some schools increase the funding for supports, but it's still not enough, right? Again, the fallout from COVID was just this huge spike of the need for services. So if somebody is struggling, if they're going to a school on aid, right, on scholarship, you need to make sure that the school that you're going to to has the mental health services on campus and you aren't going to need to supplement it off campus because that's what's going to make the support for the mental health of those particular students accessible. I think this is a good spot for Dave to address what Hopewell does to make it more accessible to people. Thank you, Daniel. So like, I love this country very, very, very much, but one of the tragedies of this country is that we don't properly fund mental health. And one thing that we don't do as a country, as a system in particular, is we don't fund many elements of what I might call psychiatric rehabilitation or um, specifically residential care for folks. There are some folks who can do just fine in the normal settings where you go to find help. And Joanna's first point would be go find help. Right. And if, if you can find an outpatient provider or an intensive outpatient program, partial hospitalization that works for you or your loved ones, that's wonderful. But that doesn't work for everybody. Some people actually need to be in residential care and residential care can be as expensive as the most expensive college you've ever thought about or heard about. And it is typically not covered by Medicaid. It's not covered by Medicare and it's not covered by health insurance. We see some of that, right? We don't see none, but if you think about cardiac rehab as opposed to psychiatric rehab, it's profoundly different. Cardiac rehab is covered, um, mental health rehab is not. So what we've done at Hopewell is thanks to the generosity of our donors, we're a not-for-profit organization, is that we have put into place over the last, really since 2020, a, a program where we can give up to a 75% discount off of our rates. Our rates are already in the lowest quartile of residential communities, and then we can go 75% off of that. That still creates a financial barrier that's insuperable for many families, but we can serve many more families now than we were able to before. And that's because of our donors and the generosity of the grant makers and the individuals who support us. How do generational cohorts, Gen X, Gen Y, et cetera, differ in terms of mental health issues? I missed that, what did you say? How do generational cohorts like Gen X, yeah. Gen Y, uh, differ in terms of mental health issues? I mean, I think that's a, a uphill battle that we're dealing with right now, all right? Boomers were the, again, I'm gonna grossly generalize. So if you're in the room and you're just like, this woman is so ridiculous, I apologize. And this is like, it's it's just a part of the work that I do, honestly. We had the eight hour version. Yeah. Whew, I don't know if any of you would even sign up for that, but that's beside the point. Um, boomers were of the generation, even some Gen X that I'm still seeing um, are the pick yourself up by your bootstraps, right? We we all know that expression. It was because we were sent off to the park and you just have to be home, you know, by dinner or, or before the sun sets. That was, that was the life, right? Like we didn't talk about mental health. It wasn't something that was discussed. Gen X came through and said, yeah, we're going to start to name it, but we're not going to completely own it. So I'm, I'm going to seek out my own health. Uh, but I may not just divulge that to anybody else unless they're really close to me. Or I would maybe only go get any type of support if it felt like it was severe enough or debilitating or impacting my daily life. 
now our generation, which is kind of the Gen Z, Gen Y is just shouting it to the rooftops. I'm in therapy. This is awesome. And yet we're also, again, when we talk about all the things that I talked about earlier today, we've got access to phone, we're self-medicating, we're struggling with where the heck we're supposed to go with our life. We're seeking help, but it's still not enough. We're in this place where it's like, we need more, we need more. And that's why it's taking everybody in this room to support this generation of young people right now and those that are coming up behind them because it's going to take everybody in this room. It's a lot. And it's great that we are breaking down the barriers around mental health stigmatization, right? Like we're, we, we talk about it. I mean, we're literally having a conversation about mental health and young adulthood. That's awesome. That may not have happened 10 years ago, let alone 30 years ago. And it will continue to be discussed for several years to come. Kids have this idea that they don't have to go to college because they can just play video games online and make money or be content creators or YouTube creators that money will just come to them. <laughs> Is there a question? No. <laughs> they just want you to know that. Okay. That's very common. Yes. All right. Here is a question. What, if any, is your recommendation to break the stigma on mental illness at work or in professional settings, especially if you fear judgment or rejection? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, I think that speaks to work environments, right? That's organizational culture in general. That's a completely separate conversation, but I think somebody has to do it. Um, right? Somebody has, somebody has to carve the path, pave the way for generations to come. I think there's also that idea of like, if I am trying to fear, fear of retaliation or rejection, that's just a part of our, our own resilience. We have to ask for it if we need it, you have to advocate for it. And if that person is saying no, and if that's really important, then we need to individually make a decision. Is this work environment where I want to be? And I think we're going to continue to see the trend and that that could also be kind of a generational difference, right? Of like boomers running big offices that are saying, what do you mean we need a, a mental health day, right? Or a wellness hour, like that's silly. It's not, it's important, it's needed. And so I think that that's just in general, it's going to shift as the workforce continues to shift. Somebody would like to know where to find the accelerator programs where you can earn six figures after six months. Right? <laughs> Send me an email. I got you. A lot of them are in Silicon Valley. Actually, most of them are in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have students who do volunteer work as part of a class. They feel they are slaves. They don't seem to make or feel the connection of feeling good is something lacking. Yeah. I mean, the short answer is yes, but it's, it's probably like, again, more education around it. If it feels like an obligation, then maybe it's, it's the feeling of that forced nature is maybe not playing out at home too, right? The importance of volunteering, giving back. And then if we're doing that in school and the students like, why am I doing this? Right. That's that's how that can, it's just like, I think in all areas or all environments, it needs to be important. So maybe the conversation for that person is we need to take it to the families, take it to like the communities and say, this needs to be prioritized so that it becomes normalized, accepted, interesting, right? If we also explain why it's important, not just like it's an obligation, then yeah, it could work. Uh, this one might have been uh, some miss maybe misheard something, but uh, mental health conditions, this is the last one, begin at or after 24 years old, second leading cause of death of su is suicide between 15 and 25, help need it before 15. So did you say something about 24 somewhere in there? There was uh, a 75 a per, a percentage that says 75% of mental health disorders actually are present before the age of 24. Not saying that they don't come later, just more statistically, we're going to see it prevalent during that young adulthood, which is why it's so important for us to help this population. And and before 15. Yes, for sure. absolutely. In fact, I, I, 
I don't work with adolescents, as you know that, but I am around other people that do, and I'm hearing more and more stories of seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds that have suicide ideation, and it's terrifying to me to think about how we need to help them now. Otherwise, they may not even make it to young adulthood. Yeah. When did diagnosis symptoms happen? Symptoms are present well before 24. When did diagnosis happen? I think it really depends on the awareness and acceptance of mental health in general within the family system. Because if what I'm often seeing is it's not even addressed until like after the age of 18. Like, oh, I just thought that that was normal, right? Insert whatever type of whatever you are seeing, right? A behavior, a pattern, something like that. It's not really showing up until all of a sudden the young, or it's not, it's not identified or named specifically until there's an opportunity to be outside of the house and have somebody reflect like, actually, this is what's going on. So that's more common. I don't, I, I mean, again, my lens is young adults. So when we're talking about more of these like severe persistent mental illness type diagnoses, we're not really going to see it so much or name it until they're launching into adulthood. So just one, one more question okay. on Zoom. So I work as a peer support specialist for a first episode psychosis program in Cleveland. Sometimes I see the young people I work for, or even the people situated to help them sell themselves way short of what is possible. What can we do to encourage young people to reach for challenging goals rather than just settle for mediocrity? This is regarding job prospects, educational pursuits, relationships, uh, sometimes people just accept that if I have a serious mental illness, I am destined to work a low income job and just try to get by. It's so important for us then to make sure that we are raising up the voices, showing short videos, having opportunities for community gatherings, books, podcasts, you name it, where we have young adults who have had experiences like that that are saying, and here's what I do right? Because if we are settling for mediocrity, we're going to settle for it unless we see otherwise, right? Again, we're living in a world where everybody is looking to seek validation or seek some sort of uh, path or purpose or kind of drive. If you're comparing yourself to somebody, if all of a sudden you've had this first break and you're like, this is it, this is the end. But if all of a sudden, immediately after that, you're actually seeing people who are doing wildly successful. Again, success is subjective. So what does that look like? You have a full-time career, you're in law school, like all the cool things that are just like, that's awesome. We need to be able to show and demonstrate those stories. Otherwise we are going to continue to have mediocrity or settling for mediocrity. Great questions. All right, we've gone through the written questions that we had. Um, so unless someone objects and has a question at their table that we haven't gotten to yet, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming tonight, everyone for coming on Zoom. Joanna, thank you so much for being our speaker tonight and coming out to Hopewell this morning. Daniel, Tim, Ann, and the development team for pulling all this together. And again, back to the Cutlers for being behind the creation of this event, which is now in its 12th year. So thank you all. And we are officially over. Woo. Thank you.